He was a morbidly obese surgeon destined for an operating table and an early death. Now he's a rebel MD who is fabulously fit and fighting to make America healthy again. This is Stay Off My Operating Table with Dr. Philip Ovedia. We do. Yes, we hear you we just can. fine. Perfect. This is fantastic. Is this the first real hardcore nerdy engineer we've had on the show? It, I this think is. <laughs> Ah, okay. Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, we are joined today by the apparently OCD Dave Feldman. Um, I've been cruising his website, and I know I say this every show, but God, this looks really, really cool. I cannot wait for this conversation. So, Phil, wind us up, and I, I haven't introduced the show. Hey, it's Stay Off My Operating Table podcast, everybody. Y'all know that. Bill, introduce the, uh, the, our guest to us. Sure thing. I think a lot of my audience is going to be very familiar with Dave already. And I guess I'll say that Dave's OCD may be what saves us all. Uh, but, uh, you know, the um, Dave, first and foremost, is a uh, citizen scientist and uh, really excited to uh, talk with him about that journey that he's been on. And we'll get into some of the details of the um, ideas that he has brought forth and uh, importantly, how he's um, testing those ideas. So uh, with that, Dave, why don't you tell our audience a little bit about yourself? Uh, sure. Well, first of all, of course, thanks for having me. Um, it's interesting. It, my backstory reads like fiction. It really does because I really had no interest in medicine or nutrition or any of that. Uh, just say, eight years ago. And uh, yeah, as you mentioned, I'm an engineer. I actually uh, cut my teeth on developing um, the fairly complex platforms of various types. Um, while I liked apps, more recently, we've uh, done a lot of things with high security uh, gambling platforms. Um, I live here in Las Vegas, of course, so it's not too uncommon uh, to get into I things. Like that. Oh, yeah. And I was it, there yesterday. Oh, you were? No kidding. Well, ne yeah. next time you should Hi. visit. <laughs> so, yeah. No um, <laughs> I uh, I went on a ketogenic diet in 2015. Uh, and as many know, the story goes, um, I was just having fantastic results. I, I really loved it. It was just a, it was a great experience. And uh, like many, I was excited to finally see my blood work. And then uh, sure enough, I had a big shock because while everything looked great, the one, uh, or I should say two markers of interest, total and LDL cholesterol, the so-called bad cholesterol had shot through the roof. And that triggered my newest obsession, which I thought was only going to take over for a few days. And then it turned into weeks and then months and now years <laughs> um, to try to understand why. And as a software engineer, I thought then, and I'll say today, it's really like a network, like the same kinds of networks that I've worked on my whole life, except far more advanced and complex. So as I, as I was reading your website, cholesterolcode.com, um, I was thinking, oh, crap, we're going to have one of those high-level scientific conversations, and I'm going to be asking all kinds of questions, begging you to to turn this into normal English for people like me. And um, you, you, uh, you anticipated that. So Phil, would you maybe pick up where, where Dave talked about this bad news of his cholesterol skyrocketing after the ketogenic and talk to us about how doctors respond to that and then we'll take it from there yeah i think that's a good uh you know place to start um so obviously you know people uh recognize that you know oftentimes the singular focus or uh certainly the primary focus of those in the heart disease space is around cholesterol levels and specifically um ldl so-called bad cholesterol 
uh, and total cholesterol, as Dave mentioned, have been the traditional, have been the markers that have risen to the top uh, in terms of predicting heart disease risk. And the, the uh, concept that goes along with that is that if you manage your LDL cholesterol levels, if you keep them low, you're going to avoid heart disease. Um, as we've discussed many times on this show, um, I have made the observation repeatedly throughout my career that that doesn't always happen. And then, you know, as I started getting into the low carb space, uh, this other, you know, conundrum, we'll call it, arose, uh, that there are many people uh, like Dave is talking about that see their LDL cholesterol levels go up when they start low carb and ketogenic diets. Uh, and it's not clear that those people are uh, increasing or worsening their risk for heart disease. And a lot of the other blood markers we look at, uh, you know, seem to contradict that. So um, that's kind of, I think, uh, the question that Dave stumbled onto. And um, honestly, you know, uh, Dave, uh, Dave's work uh, was seminal in, you know, opening my eyes to this question, because in medical school, it was a totally answered question. LDL bad, high LDL bad. And you, there was no, you know, no questioning that it was dogma. It was fact. And, uh, as you get into it and we'll talk about this, certainly we realize it's not, not quite, uh, as it's billed. So to go back a little bit, Dave, um, what, what prompted you to start a ketogenic diet in the first place? Uh, yeah, well, it was um, frankly to avoid type two diabetes. In 2015, keto wasn't quite that big yet, but it's um, it's sort of um, I guess you could say precursor is LCHF, low carb, high fat, which you know is still a term used today. Um, but at that time, I had gotten my blood work, and for the second annual test in a row, i had had an A1C of 6.1, which is right in the middle range for prediabetes. The doctor's office said, well, we'll keep monitoring it. And knowing it was rampant on my dad's side of the family, I was like, well, no, I'm, I'm not going to keep monitoring. I want to find out how to interventionally stop it from happening. And that's what I heard about LCHF from, of all places, uh, diabetes forums. Now, I myself, again, coming from technology, it's not so much that we don't think um, institutions don't carry a lot of expertise. They often do. And it's why, you know, I would, I would recommend people work with their doctors and so forth. But that said, uh, it is also the case that a lot of times we can be distracted by what we're looking for, just kind of the story of LDL cholesterol. But in the case of uh, diabetes, same thing. I think that a lot of the institutions were a bit distracted by what they were looking for, where there was a lot of data that was emerging um, that was shown in these uh, forums. And that's why I think I had a lot of trust in them. Now, the irony is at that time, when I'm asking these same forums, I'm like, okay, I'm going to go on a diet high in saturated fat and so forth, but won't my cholesterol go through the roof? And most people had said at that time, and I think it would be, it would have been accurate to say this at that time, that that was a rarity. That even for those people who did go on a diet high in saturated fat, the vast majority would not see this huge skyrocketing effect in their LDL. And that's the other interesting part of my story, which is that after I'd gone low carb, high fat at that time, my dad and my sister got inspired to do so, but they were not as metabolically healthy as, as I am. They'll concede this, by the way, I'm not, I'm not saying anything too bad, but they did not see that extraordinary rise in LDL cholesterol that I did. And it's part of what fueled my obsession is that I saw this change, but those two did not. Um, so that that's really kind of what spring loaded is. I really just didn't want to get di diabetes and what it's worth. I've never had a, a 6.1 in one C since of course, as I did in fact, bring it down. So like uh, like I assumed doctors were, I'm realizing isn't true in the medical profession, but real scientists have a question that they ask. They have a thesis and they construct uh, experiments and they observe 
and then they adjust their thesis and their experiments just to follow the findings. So if we can, if we can, let's back up. What is what was your thesis, and then take us through that? Yeah, well, the uh, the variables, as I just mentioned, the fact that my first um, set of variables were my own first degree relatives. That to me seemed very strongly pushing back against the notion that it was genetic, because that's where I would have assumed it would be, given all the literature I was reading at that time. That, that what was genetic? This this rise or that, lack of rise in the cholesterol? Yes, correct, correct. That that effectively you can't see. Like my LDL cholesterol through my life had been roughly a hundred and uh, hundred and twenty to one hundred thirty. My LDL cholesterol, and. So when I immediately went to the literature to say, hey, how did that suddenly change from those levels up to, say, uh, 230, which, again, was very alarming to me at the time. In the literature, it would say that, no, if it's above 190, then you have what's known as familial hypercholesterolemia, FH, and that is genetic, that that actually is the diagnostic criteria that effectively you can't get to those levels unless it's genetic. Now, bear in mind, I did not have that much background in reading papers at that time sure. and so forth. But I thought that doesn't make sense for two reasons. One, because I have these first degree relatives. The other is because this should have been lifelong. Why would I have had this LDL of 120 to 130 and then suddenly had it at these levels unless there's more to the story? And to your point, yes, from a I would, I would say science is like the tent pole, if you will, right? And medicine's over here, even if I hadn't gotten into medicine, believe me, in engineering, we're going by scientific principles all the time. We have exactly. to, in order to develop what we do. All right. Yeah, so the, the, I was just going to say the interesting contrast between, you know, uh, how engineers look at these uh, issues and I think, you know, the medical system looks at these issues is the medical system is largely accepting of exceptions to rules, you know, and we say something like, you know, high LDL cholesterol leads to heart disease. And we ignore, you know, that there are people who have high LDL cholesterol who don't develop heart disease. And we ignore that there are people with low LDL cholesterol who develop heart disease. Um, and, you know, we're, we're willing to, you know, take the exceptions. And those exceptions are oftentimes blamed on things like genetics. And you'll just say, well, you know, it must be his genetics that are different. Um, and, you know, the approach uh, that the engineers and, and that, you know, Dave uh, has talked about uh, was, you know, that if, if there's an exception to the rule, there's a pro the rule is broken. Uh, and then you need to figure out what the real rule is around this. So, uh, that that has always been an interesting part of this uh, story uh, to me uh, is just thinking about these things in a different way. So you're yeah. debugging a problem. That's a exactly right. A doctor is is uh, performing a diagnosis and and maybe coming up with a prescription, but you're an engineer, and to you, you're you've got a bug, or at least what appears to be a bug. You've, you design systems and the system is cranking something out that ain't supposed to be there. Right. Well, and if you're the system, you have a lot of extra motivation. That's what high, happens. High motivation. <laughs> you're, you're going, wait a sec. What? It, it's the very first question I'm wanting to understand is, is this, is this a broken system? Did, is, did something crack and change? Because the first thing I'm seeing when I'm looking into the literature at that time is that there really are kind of two categories of folks who have high LDL. There's that first group I just mentioned, those who have genetically high levels of LDL. But you look a little bit deeper and you find that they have some form of dysfunctional lipid metabolism at a cellular level. So they either have like a mutation uh, with their receptor such that they can't easily metabolize, they can't pull in uh, LDL particles, they have uh, something with the ligand itself so that they can't bind because the, the protein that wraps it, like ApoB, um, doesn't bind properly. So these are all reasons that there's a higher amount that's left in circulation, but that's not the whole story. The other part of the story is these cells are not succeeding 
at binding and gathering them. And I know that there's a lot of focus on the cells that are in the liver for clearance, but again, not the end of the story. It's also in play for those uh, immune cells like macrophages. Well, macrophages are right there at the scene of atherosclerosis. And so again, I, I as the engineer, I'm like, well, if we're looking under the hood, we should look at every aspect of this piece. Okay, so that's one category. The other category is some form of dysfunction in lipid metabolism that's an acquired disease, like okay. metabolic uh, uh, syndrome. Real, real quick. Oh, sorry, did I? Well, I you, you've already used about 17 terms that um, if I hadn't already looked at your website, I'd be saying you got to define that. Oh, so fair enough. I real quickly, I just want to tell our listeners, Dave's website has everything he's talking about with in two different versions. He's got it for the for the folks like me who don't understand all the science, but he explains it very clearly. And then he's got folks like Phil who all this stuff makes sense. So the one thing I do want you to to back up on is uh this chemistry of, of the the macrophage at the site and what's going on there and then we'll take it on. Sure. I, I tell you what, let me back up even a step further. Okay. I've got a good layperson pitch. We're when we're being fueled by fat, that is going to take a more complex process than being fueled by glucose. So right now, you can go to your your cabinet, grab some sugar and throw it in water, and you're going to find it just it evenly distributes into the water. But if you go and grab some oil, if you grab some butter, right, you throw it into water, it's not. It's going to clump together and it's going to, you know, it, and that's actually a difficult challenge that evolution had to solve for because we have fat soluble vitamins like A, D, E, and K that's in our food that our cells need. And our wa our blood is water based. So how did our bodies figure out how to maneuver this stuff into our bloodstream, including not just those vitamins, but fat itself? How can we be fueled by fat if we need to move it around? So our body makes proteins that help make it soluble in the same way. And it's the genius of the human body that it goes, well, I'm not going to make just one protein for each kind of fat. I'm going to make one protein that's like a tanker that all of the different lipids, these, these uh, water phobic things can go into like a submarine and then throw it into the bloodstream and then it can move around and then have a system that the cells can use to get things out of those submarines. Is that a good lay person? That's really good. So okay, good. Now you hear the term metabolism all the time. And here's, here's my version of metabolism for lay person. Metabolism is this counterbalance between anabolism, which is the building up of stuff and catabolism, which is the breaking down of stuff. And metabolism is how good you are at building up and breaking down stuff in a good balance. That's really what metabolism is. And nowhere is that more important than fuel. We care a lot about how good you are at putting fuel away that you're consuming and getting it back out. And at the end of the day, no matter how complex all this stuff gets, when people are talking about a good metabolism, they're talking about one that's very efficient at doing both of those. When we're born, we're really good at that, right? And that's why you'll hear me jump into those two other metrics that I know Philip loves a lot, which is your HDL cholesterol and your triglycerides. Triglycerides are that cargo in those submarines that are the proteins that we'll talk about. And HDL, and here's the part that I myself didn't really understand to the degree that I do now until the last few years. The reason higher HDL cholesterol tends to associate with better metabolism, whether you're on a low-carb diet or not, is that it's actually kind of a proxy for the successful level by which you're putting fuel away. That's what's pretty fascinating about it. So when you see HDL being high and triglycerides being low, whatever your LDL level is, you probably are good at that process of metabolism. How, how am I doing so far? I'm. I, this is great. Yeah. I'm, I think I'm getting it. it I, my brain feels like it understands. So the last part of the the puzzle is exactly what I was talking about before. If you've got a broken system to where you're, you have an incapability of putting fuel away, whatever diet you're on, 
it's not surprising to see your triglycerides go up because basically what that means is there's a traffic jam that's going on with those proteins. They're failing to get that put away into your tissues, especially your adipose sites, your, your fat cells. And another part of that failure of putting it away is that there's less of those components from that first version of protein over to the second, which is the HDL. HDL is a um, has a particular protein that wraps it called ApoA1. You don't need to memorize that, but you do Thank need you. to know that we make a bunch of them and we leave them in circulation to pick up a lot of the stuff that's part of that, that turnover, that process of putting it away. But the big reveal is what's that famous protein that's bringing all of these lipids in? It's a very, very famous one called ApoB. And the, the major class of lipoprotein, this macro complex that's, that means all of it in there is an ApoB containing lipoprotein. And if it comes from the gut, it's a chylomicron. If it comes from storage predominantly, it's a VLDL. Um, but, it, but the VLDLs famously remodeled to LDL. And that's, that's what excited me uh, was as I was learning more about this, the more I was like, well, actually, I think what's happening to me and not to my sister and my dad is because I'm leaner and because I run a lot more, I'm trafficking more of these ApoB proteins because I need to move more of them into circulation. I need to use more of them. And I also need to put them away and take them out at a faster rate, all else being equal. That's what I think. And that was the beginnings of what I now call the lipid energy model. And it's why I think it explains why paradoxically, the people with the highest LDL and ApoB levels in a low-carb, high-fat diet are this phenotype I'm very focused on that not only have very high LDL, but they also have high HDL and low triglycerides, and it's extremely ubiquitous. It's across all these different ethnicities, all these different ages, all of you know genders, everything. That's what excites me as an engineer. Bill, and I could ask a lot of stupid guy questions, but this is probably where you need to jump in. Well, so, you know, what uh, I think would be uh, interesting to discuss is, you know, you you develop this theory, uh, you know, which, like you said, is now kind of known as the lipid energy model. And you identified this group of people with this unusual uh, cluster of results, we'll say, the high HDL the low triglycerides and the high LDL. And, um, you know, that is now uh, been coined the lean mass hyper responder. And, you know, you, what was the response that you got, uh, you know, when you started bringing forth these ideas? Um, and, you know, I, I guess I'd like to hear about, you know, uh, who, who seemed interested, who didn't seem interested, and you know, what kind of response you got from the various uh, communities uh, on, these, uh, on these thoughts? Well, yes, this, is, uh, this was another place where it got a, a bit interesting because I think I've, at that time, sort of assumed that a lot of folks who are certainly a lot more uh, educated in lipidology than I am would take this and run with it. Like it was just a matter of getting it to the right person. And then they would be snatching it out of my hands and being like, thank you very much. Um, that's very nice. As an engineer, we can take it from here. Um, certainly we're very interested in how it is that some folks could have this high LDL in a dose dependent manner based on uh, how lean they are and how low carb they are. Uh, things along those lines, which in my opinion, wasn't Again, it it was prominent enough that I would have thought a lot of people would be very interested who study cholesterol in particular as not just a profession, but also as a field of science to see how this would relate to the pathologies of such as atherosclerosis. Because here's the hard truth. The hard truth is that the vast majority of the data that we have that links high LDL to atherosclerosis are on those two groups I was just talking about, those folks that have some form of dysfunction in lipid metabolism. We actually don't prospectively study folks who have high LDL, but are otherwise metabolically healthy. It's just assumed that you can extrapolate that data from those other 
folks that have some form of dysfunction and that it'll apply to those people who are healthy. So yes, there was a- This is, this is kind of like you take a group of folks who have suffered polio and you note that their 100 meter sprint times are all excessive, are all over 30 seconds. And, and you reverse back and say, people who run over 30 second 100 meter sprints um, are all crippled. You're, you're confusing the cause and the effect. Is that, am I getting it right? Maybe not yeah. a good analogy. I, I, but. I actually have an, an, I have an analogy that I like a lot, um, which is it's, it's often said, and I agree that ApoB containing lipoproteins are, are uh, causal for atherosclerosis. If you go to the scene of atherosclerosis, you will find ApoB and, and therefore if you take steps to lower ApoB, interventional steps that bring it down as low as possible, you'll have a net reduction of atherosclerosis. So that statement that it's necessary, uh, sorry, I hope I'm saying this correctly, necessary but not sufficient, uh, it's, it's a component of the process. I fully agree with. It just doesn't tell me enough because that's kind of like saying, car tires are causal for car accidents. That's objectively true. You need car tires to enter into car accidents, but do car tires drive car accidents? Because if we, if we took steps to ban all car tires in a city, we would find that there's less car accidents. The question is, in doing so, is there a trade-off? Is there, for example, because I may be taken to the hospital in a vehicle that has car tires, right? And so the the next best question to ask, which is what I did back in 2015, is to look to see if it was, say, like smoking, whereas the lower and lower and lower you get with smoking, the uh, greater and greater longevity you would see. And so it was the first thing I went for is I was like, okay, well, how does LDL associate with longevity? Because presumably the lower you go, the greater the lifespan. And to my surprise, I, I did not see that. In fact, I saw some studies that actually showed the opposite. Um, now, there's some some recent studies that would say, uh, no, there is some level, some Mendelian randomization studies that would say, no, there is some level for which if you have a higher LDL, a first degree relative could show some increase in mortality. But that's not where I started. Where I started was, look, if high LDL and particularly high ApoB is causally inducing atherosclerosis, then it would seem that people who were lucky enough to be born with as little LDL and ApoB as possible would have a clear signal of longevity. They'd be outliving us all. Like that would just be pretty obvious. Right. And to date, I've, I've not actually seen that. In fact, there's one study that came out, um, you'll have to link it in the show notes, that was on PCSK9 loss of function that went into millions of person years. And they did see an, a reduction in cardiovascular disease, but not a reduction in all-cause mortality. And that to me says quite a lot that there may indeed be some kind of a trade-off that might be in play um, for reducing of atherosclerosis, but possibly this has an impact in non-atherosclerosis. Again, it's theoretical, but it's certainly one I would be interested in exploring. Yeah, so just to highlight that, you know, the, the, the view in the medical community is that um, LDL cholesterol or ApoB, you know, depending on who you're talking to is, you know, causal of heart disease and it by itself having elevated levels of this is, you know, is, can cause heart disease is the primary driver of heart disease. And, you know, that idea is so ingrained in the medical community, uh, that you can't even question it. So, um, you know, I know that Dave has gotten a lot of pushback uh, from some of the leading uh, lipidologists um, if for even asking this question, for even considering it to be a possibility uh, that maybe there are situations where having high ApoB, high LDL uh, is not uh, causative of heart disease and, and in fact, you know, may... Uh, may prolong life. And the, the other issue we have is, is what Dave was alluding to as well, uh, that we um, have sort of lost 
uh, the context of LDL. And uh, the, the general thinking in medicine is that LDL is only related to heart disease and you know, ignoring that it may play other roles in the body uh, because we need to drive it down at all costs to drive down heart disease. So that, that's the environment that Dave has been asking these questions in. And you know, to Dave's credit, um, you know, many people would have just sort of backed off, I guess, at that point and said, okay, you know, the experts, the lipidologists, they, they certainly must know what they're talking about. Um, but Dave has persisted with his uh, theory and has taken it to the next level because he couldn't find that lipidologist to run with the ball. And so Dave ran with the ball himself and uh, designed and is in the process of doing experiments to test some of these theories. Uh, so uh, that's what I'd love to get into next, Dave, is, is talking about uh, the ways uh, the way that you have been trying to validate or like any good scientist, disprove your theory because you have said many times, uh, and I think I've heard it from almost every time I've heard you speak, uh, you admit that you might be wrong, but the only way to know is to test it. That's exactly right. And so, yes, you to kind of complete the other part of the story, it's... Um, it, it, you know, I'm sharing this research, I'm discussing this model. A lot of folks are becoming um, understandably curious. A lot of folks are becoming alarmed and a lot of them are like me, which they're both, right? They they want to understand what's going on, but there is a genuine concern that there might just be this um, willingness toward having standing levels that are of high LDL when in fact they could be causal. And exactly to your point, I have said it many times over, I 100% could be wrong. And even if I feel, as I like to say often, cautiously optimistic, I'm not going to stand on that. I want to actually gather as much data as possible. So of course, many people have shared a lot of their anecdotal data. And while we don't have them written up as case reports, I am in regular contact with folks that are at the highest level of LDL and ApoB, and usually are these lean mass hyperresponders for medical reasons. They're on a ketogenic diet, for example, uh, due to severe epilepsy. From their perspective, they're willing to take the chance on how high their LDL has gone because um, they're having difficulty with uh, different medicines that are seeking to lower LDL and they're keeping uh, closer monitoring. And so they feel it's their choice to do. I always caveat to those folks, look, this is uncharted territory and course, I'm sure you're hearing it from your lipidologist, but I'll repeat it. It may indeed be extremely high risk and don't take any level of optimism as the gospel, but it's those folks who definitely motivated me a lot to say, look, let's just get a, a study together. It seems so obvious, right? Now that we finally do have some folks who seem to have functional lipid metabolism, that they may have a high LDL for this different reason, that there isn't a traffic jam. In fact, it may be the exact opposite, that there's enormous traffic flow. Um, if we are to believe that ApoB containing lipoproteins causally induce higher levels of atherosclerosis, then those folks I just spoke of should be showing the signs like right away at a population level. And if they're not, should that induce us to uh, more actively want to study this prospectively Then yes. And so in 2019, I got up at one of these conferences. I said, you know what? I've formed a public charity called the Citizen Science Foundation, and I want to just raise a lot of money so that we can just do our own study. Let's go ahead and make it happen. And the low-carb community stepped up to their credit and helped us fund the study. That's been a lot of what I've been doing to date is both raising the money to make this happen, then designing the protocol, getting true IRB approval, and fortunately getting a partner in Dr. Budoff, who's a luminary in the field of CT and geography to do this study for us. And uh, uh, Philip, I'm, I'm sure you'll appreciate this. There was a, um, in, in the beginning, they were saying, you know, you'd be able to do this given just how high their LDL levels are with like say 30 people, maybe 40. And I was like, I want 100. I want 100 participants because you hear a study that's on 30 people, 40 people. Of course, you should be able to go by things like statistical significance 
and exposure levels, but you know 100 is a little bit more of an emotional number for all of us. It's It kind of breaks into the next range for us. And I'm proud to say that, yes, we just now, just literally this last month, um, scanned all 100 of our first visits. And um, as I know your, your co-host may not be familiar with this, Jack, but the uh, the other part of the study is everybody who gets a single first scan um, with this a CT angiogram will then get a second successive scan one year later. So we'll have CT angiography to compare between the two. And that way we can actually see if indeed there is this rapid progression of atherosclerosis at a population level, which is what would be predicted right now by the existing lipid hypothesis. Okay. Let me ask a possibly dangerous question. Assume your hypothesis is correct, that the presence of high LDL is not, does not, uh, let, let, let me take it farther. Assume your study shows that there is no causal correlation between high LDL and, and heart disease. Who does those findings threaten? Well, let me roll you back for a sec because I want to qualify. Okay. First of all, the, the study we're doing right now, I'm actually going to dilute the excitement level of it to some degree because as a good scientist, we should properly say, hey, I'm only testing a particular context. So I'm testing the particular context of lean mass hyperresponders and borderline lean mass hyperresponders with their high LDL when it seems to be metabolically induced. So I can't make a categorical claim, um, even if I had 10 studies like this, that is around LDL altogether. But I will say that if the lipid hypothesis, as it currently stands, suggests that in all contexts, we should see this inducement of a higher level of LDL and atherosclerosis, it does challenge that. It challenges the, the overallness, if you will, of how much LDL causes atherosclerosis. Right. So you're, the, you're that actually guy on the on the internet, aren't you? Yes. <laughs> actually. Okay, Phil. Yeah. You're not so, an engineer. If, if if Dave is right, whose ox gets gored? Well, you know, I think what um Dave and, and many others have been uh talking about and, and certainly what I have been talking about is um, right now, the perception around LDL is it's an absolute. LDL high is bad. And, um, you know, I have had plenty of clinical observations that go against that. You know, the literature is, is awash with observations that go against that. Uh, but, you know, all Dave is trying to do and, uh, you know, all that I would hope would come out of Dave's work is that we can at least you know, reopen that conversation that maybe not all high LDL is bad. Uh, and there are contexts where certainly it may be bad, and there are contexts where it's not bad. And uh, if we can at least open up that conversation, um, of course, it starts to challenge the um, prevailing environmental, uh, the pre prevailing environment today that all high LDL is bad, and therefore we must lower uh, everyone's LDL. And obviously, that's you know uh, been pushed by uh, the pharmaceutical industry that has an interest in this. Um, and you know, quite frankly, the uh, lipidology community uh, has kind of staked its uh, specialty on that. Um, you know, that's what they do. Uh, so I think bringing more context to this discussion is all that, you know, Dave and, and others are asking for. And uh, that's why I think this will be such an enlightening uh, study, because um, it, it, it's the black swan, uh, you know, kind of theory. Uh, once there's one black swan, you can no longer say all swans are white. Uh, so um, that's what we're trying to uh, figure out here. That's what Dave is trying to figure out. So i um, really excited to see where this leads. And um, I guess with that, I'll say that this has already led to uh, another step in the process. 
And uh, that's what I was really excited to bring Dave on today to talk about is kind of uh, the next step in the process of figuring out this, uh, this unanswered question. Yeah, thanks for teeing that up. It, this hasn't been a, um, what you're referring to, I would call in the technology business a soft launch because I haven't actually stated this very openly and actively. But at the low carb conference that we were both at, I got to share with the audience at that time that indeed the preliminary data for this study, those first 100 visits were so compelling that we're now in talks for putting together a companion study. So at first, we assumed that this first study would need to get to its completed stage before we do what's known as a confirmatory study, a study in succession. So after the first study is done, we do the second study. Frankly, um, this, this initial data has just been so astonishing. We're so confident that it's novel that I'm already talking with some of the donors right now. I'm already talking with the Lundquist Institute on the next design. And we think that we're going to be putting together a companion study in the near future the companion study will have some things that the current study doesn't, such as a control group, um, will actually have a more relaxed eligibility criteria. But in effect, what we're looking to do is again, see if lightning strikes twice. <laughs> see if to get to the black swans, right? It's not even just a black swan because some people will use the example of the, you know, the 90 year old who smokes three packs a day. No, on the contrary, you shouldn't be able to identify a group of people given the existing lipid hypothesis, who you say, hey, I've identified these folks and they have the highest LDL uh, in that they're in the top 10 of the top 1%, like our current population for this current uh, group. And yet they don't have this uh, pronounced increase in atherosclerosis that would be expected given the existing literature, the existing um, uh, lipid hypothesis as it stands today. And if that doesn't, if that shows in one study, it can be very groundbreaking. But if it shows in two studies, at least two or more studies, that's the point where you actually have confirmatory data that could really change the landscape. So many questions I want to ask, Bill. Yeah, fire away. I mean, you know, I'll just say that, like, you know, I'm I'm very excited uh, about this, and that, you know. Uh, again, what I'm excited about is that this um, will hopefully uh, spur the the let's call it the mainstream medical community uh, to take an interest in this question. Again, you know, um, if if the study results uh, come out um, in such a way that it looks like this is a good theory. Uh, then the onus is on the medical community to, you know, run the, uh, you know, run more studies, uh, because that's the definition of science. Uh, and Dave's results need to be reproduced, uh, you know, to be able to be accepted. Um, and, um, you know, I think the onus is on the uh, scientific community, uh, the traditional lipid community, we'll call it, to disprove, uh, you know, if, if Dave's experiment looks positive, then you know what was wrong about Dave's experiment, or or what you know aspect of it, you know, uh, can we can we then disprove? Well, I I will say it. I don't. Again, I say this occasionally. I don't have a license that can be taken away, so I can be a little bit reckless, I guess, but. There is a multi-billion dollar drug that has made a lot of people very wealthy for a long time that would be put at risk. Uh, its its usefulness would be shown to be uh, not what we were told it was. I'm, tr I'm, I'm actually being more careful than I normally am. You, you, you are the, the whole purpose of a statin is to lower LDL. I'll it's, steal, I'll steel man that a little bit, even though I'm, I'm trying to be careful uh, whenever the discussion of cholesterol lowering medications come up. I think that there, I think that there are sort of two schools of thought. There are some folks who are pro LDL lowering who would say, well, statins may not be working through the lowering of LDL. 
but they do have maybe they're anti-inflammatory. Maybe they're just more successful through other means. But I do, and and I think Philip agrees on this one, I do push back on whether you can hold both positions at the same time. Can you state that the reason there is a reduction in, say, um, cardiovascular events in secondary prevention is due to lowering of LDL? Or, or are there things, since every drug does more than one thing, are there things for which there is some value? Well, I, I would encourage the medical community to get to that greater level of specificity. But I think to the point that you're coming to, and certainly one I'm interested in, is can we just acknowledge that maybe there is efficacy in some of these drugs for like say secondary prevention that shouldn't just by default be assumed to apply to primary prevention for people who are metabolically healthy? Why not just study folks who are metabolically healthy? I would encourage, I would encourage the drug companies to do a primary prevention, low risk um, study to see how their drugs affect that population. But I, you know, I'm doubtful that that's actually going to happen because of course it would cost a lot more money. It would have to have a longer time span. And I don't know how much I can count on them making that data available to do retrospective studies or anything along those lines. Regardless, I would hope everybody would agree on this one tenet, which is you don't want to put somebody under any medical therapy for which um, there's clear data that suggests that 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 there's no good reason for it. So in that regard, yes, I'm. If they're not doing it, but we're at least helping to put that data together, at least it's happening, and at least now we'll have some idea as to how much it matters or doesn't. Specifically, the LDL lowering portion of it. And, and you know. The the reason this is so important, um, you know, as Dave alluded to, is, um, you know, there are plenty of people who are benefiting greatly from these diets, um, and they are being actively discouraged from staying on these diets uh, because of this issue, because their LDL cholesterol has gone up some. Um, and so, you know, that's why I think this is such an important question for us to answer, uh, because you know, there are unintended consequences of this, you know, lowering LDL at all costs uh, approach. Um, and, you know, th th there's the specific um, dietary approaches that people are taking. And then quite frankly, there is the overall dietary approach that has come out of the, the diet heart hypothesis, the low fat diet, uh, that at this point has clearly done damage on a societal level. You know, we, we really have all the evidence we need of that. We've had 40 years of low fat diets and our health as a society has clearly worsened during that time. Uh, so, um, you know, that is the bigger question uh, or the bigger issue that I think answering this question can help us get to. Well, this is one of those where I really just want to take Dave off into a corner and make sure I've got him alone for about three hours and just pepper him with questions. And I commend you, Dave, for for being uh, uh, your circumspection, your clear um, scientific approach, dispassionate, objective approach to the problem. Thank you. It's 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 really cool to talk to somebody like that. And for somebody who's basically a bomb thrower like me, it's also a little maddening, but um, you've done a great job. I know folks are listening to this and are going, okay, I want to know more. Point us in the right direction. Well, of course, you just mentioned uh, the site cholesterolcode.com. Uh, the foundation, citizenscienceFoundation.org is where we also, if you want to make a charitable contribution to our study directly, you can do it by going to citizensciencefoundation.org. I'm happy to say, by the way, we have a 0% admin overhead. The only money that is taken is for like third-party services, such as credit card processing and so forth. But that's literally why I created the foundation was so that there would be no conflicts of interest um, discussed because there's no, there's not a penny I make or anybody who's uh, involved on the design side. It all goes to the research and the institute and so forth. And then, of course, there's, um, I'll, I'll mention our service, Own Your Labs, but that's because my entire partner share goes also back to the Citizen Science Foundation. Um, but Own Your Labs is a, a 
private blood testing service that we have where people can basically order their blood work. We have an additional citizen science component to it, which is that you can opt in to uh, take the citizen science discounts 10% off if you provide your anonymized data for our anonymized data archive, uh, which we in intend to be making available for citizen researchers. Uh, because unfortunately, there's not a lot of open data on low carbers. And I'm happy to say that a lot of low carb people uh, go through our service. So we'll eventually have that data up and available, and then people can make use of that as well. And of course, I'm, I'm very active on Twitter. Uh, so Philip will attest, you can, uh, you can usually get a hold of me if you need to have a quick question or something like that, at Real Dave Feldman. The Real Dave Feldman, not one of the, the myriad uh, counterfeits, I'm assuming. There's a lot of Dave Feldmans on Twitter, that's for sure. Huh. All right. Well, we, as always, we'll make sure all that contact information is available on the show notes. And uh, Dave, thanks, man. It was every bit as good as I'd hoped and uh, not nearly as long as I wished. So, <laughs> Thank please, you, Brad. Please come back. Yeah, we'll definitely have Dave back more as we get some uh, more results, uh, you know, from the study. And uh, we'll just keep pushing this along. So thanks for all the work you're doing, Dave. And uh, look forward to hearing what comes of it. Thanks again so, for having me on. Very good. Till next time, we'll talk to you all. America is fat and sick and tired. 88% of Americans are metabolically unhealthy and at risk of a sudden heart attack. Are you one of them? Go to ifixhearts.co and take Dr. Ovedia's metabolic health quiz. Learn specific steps you can take to reclaim your health, reduce your risk of heart attack, and stay off Dr. Ovedia's operating table.